I never enjoyed photography before. Waiting for the perfect moment, searching for the perfect frame or aiming for the best focus used to frustrate me. The effort of concentrating on the perfect shot would usually succumb to the experience itself. One would assume photography comes naturally to architects, but for me this simply was not the case until something happened at a ceramic workshop on the way to Tashkent. I felt something unique about this place and decided not to focus on photography, but simply on experiencing the site itself. Here something was different for me. Soon I found myself clicking away without prior contemplation. I was so intrigued by the scene that for the first time I felt as though photography was not an added event. My being present and taking the photographs were not two distinct activities, somehow they had merged. I knew this was a new beginning, without my conscious attempt. Something had cleared, something had opened. Martin Heidegger described this event in terms of unfolding as unconcealedness. I was once asked, how could you feel entirely immersed in the experience of the ceramic studio if the camera was always there? The camera is always an added event. The camera would have been an added event if there was never an unfolding. Heidegger has argued that the equipment, the camera, disappears in usefulness. In fact, he argues that the more handy a piece of equipment is, the more inconspicuous it remains, the more essentially the work opens itself, the more luminous it becomes the uniqueness of the fact that it is rather than is not. In Cartier-Bresson's decisive moment of the unfolding, the camera is no longer. It gives way in the state that Heidegger had referred to as the moment of vision. As the whole existential constitution gets laid bare, that makes possible what he calls authentic historicality. This state Heidegger describes in terms of a certain groundlessness that we can associate with the life of a nomad in terms of being everywhere yet belonging nowhere, which is open, ambiguous, indeterminate, and interpretive, as it also parallels the character of postmodern art and architecture vis-a-vis -vis film and photography. Alan Tochtenberg talks about photographs being unable to capture the objective reality because they are interpretations Versions of reality that in documenting the facts, they express ideas and opinions. This understanding of reality is plausible. It seems to assume that there is a fixed objective reality out there that we can capture, which somehow is missed in a photograph. Today's worldview, however, would see this kind of thinking to be naive and suggest there is no single reality out there, whether objective or subjective. These days, everything is seen as interpretation, and that is the best either we or our photographs can do. Historian Tani Barlow calls each photograph a historical catechesis, as she argues that Every picture records things, but at the same time has been snapped out of context, and hints of as many more things unseen, things that we can sense but not witness. That which can be used as a witness in a house of court can't always bring us to the hidden realities that reside in the events themselves. Facts and figures only represent what we choose to see in them. On the other hand, both philosophers Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty would suggest it is only in this getting snapped out of context that the real existential constitution of something gets truly laid bare. In other words, 
When things are embedded in their everyday context, their reality always remains hidden. I see these categories as a scholar K1 Tarabi has described as idealizations frozen in positivity of language. Instead of clarifying, they confuse and blur the issues at hand. Being is not a genus, Martin Heidegger has argued in Being and Time, to free us from generalization, categorization, and referentialism. In Aristotle's discussion of Plato's categorization of various modes of knowledge, Heidegger points out in description of techni, sometimes something weird happens and a certain knowing arises by accident. This knowing Aristotle could not explain or categorize. He referred to it simply in terms of the otherwise. Otherwise, what is known in the strict sense stands outside of knowledge and may change. Otherwise contains the other, both and rather than either or. We, our group itself, became metaphor that is the Silk Road, extending from one discipline to the next, from one religion, ethnicity, or language to another. Using everyone's photographs in November 2006, my historian colleague Mary Fredrickson and I set up the exhibit Cocoon Dehiscence, the Otherwise of the Silk Road, at the Cage Gallery of Miami University. In our discussions about the exhibit format, I envisioned the photographs as four inch by four inch square representations, as moments in the air, uncategorized specks of memory that in some way would connect those who walk through the gallery to the multiplicity of events that we had witnessed along the Silk Road within the large context of its ongoing history. I wanted the, an exhibit that was both fluid and open, space that would act as a catalyst for individual interpretations. My historian colleague was initially appalled at this idea. You are suggesting we cut every photo into small squares, she asked. That would destroy the original photograph and we would lose what we do know about the provenance of each photograph, where it was taken, when the subject, as well as destroying the photograph's original frame. Historians save every scrap of evidence. She was not easily convinced. Yes, exactly, I answered. Isn't every photograph only an interpretation? Isn't every interpretation an incomplete representation itself? So we will have interpretations of interpretations of interpretations. In the exhibit, an imaginary metaphoric cocoon split open and countless strands of silk expanded to suspend photographic moments that embodied the space of the Silk Road. In this space of framed memories, the otherwise could not be grasped, and in a strange way, it slipped through our fingers and defied categorization. The otherwise defied definition. The otherwise remained silent. But more than a hundred visitors who came to the exhibit spoke eloquently about what they had saw unfolding there in the space between 